get going again. Please take your seats. All right, as we continue, we have another signing for you today. This time is between two financial institutions. Let's hear more as I introduce, and you welcome, Reda Joe Lewis, the President and Chair of the Board of Directors of Exim Bank, and Professor Benedict o Oke Orama, the President and Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Africa Export Import Bank, otherwise known as the Afrexim Bank. Let's receive them on the stage with a round of applause. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am so honored and delighted to, to be participating in the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit alongside my colleagues and directors of the Biden-Harris administration. This administration and the Export-Import Bank of the United States, we see partnerships and cooperation with Africa as central to our common future. In fact, I returned from a very successful first trip to Africa as the president and chair only a few weeks ago. The partnership that XM and Afric, XM Bank are undertaking today is very much part of the administration's commitment to revitalizing partnerships and collaborations with Africa. Afri XM Bank is referenced in XM's charter as part of our Sub-Saharan Africa congressional mandate. This mandate calls for us to collaborate more closely with institutions such as Afric Bank, and I have made this mandate a priority. Having met President Orama on several occasions, I know that he is fully committed and equally committed to our partnership in enhancing commercial ties between Africa and the United States. As President Biden said on February 5th, 2021, at the Africa Union Summit, that we believe in the nations of Africa, in the continent-wide spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation. And through the challenges ahead, altogether they are great. There is no doubt that our nations, our people, and the African Union, that we're up to the task. And the MOU that we are signing today it's just further evidence of our shared commitment. You know, to be able to partner with AfriBank in an effort to create economic opportunity and job creation in Africa and the United States, and to engage America's Africa diaspora, a source of strength who maintain close familial, social, and economic connections to the continent. Indeed, this is a new day in U.S.-Africa relations. I'm very proud to lead the XM Bank of the United States, which is one of our lead agencies implementing Prosper Africa's partnership for global infrastructure and investment and the U.S. strategy towards sub-Saharan Africa. You know, Exxon Bank has a very proud 88-year history of financing U.S. exports around the world and supporting jobs and economic development. In fact, Exxon Bank has been financing transactions in Africa since 1942, and has authorized over $7 billion in financing to the continent. And I'm pleased with the partnerships that we, did, we are developing across the continent. You know, as I mentioned last month, I traveled to Africa, and I'm so pleased that the bonds between America and Africa are strong. 
as the chair of Exxon Bank, I think in many ways, Africa is a perfect example of how our mission in financing U.S. exports is fully aligned with the economic goals of the continent. So when I think of how we can create shared prosperity, we can address these areas. Africa needs for infrastructure, the need for health care, the need for industrialization, and the need for investments for economic growth and job creation. You know, the second is the need of financing, which is the lifeblood of any economy. And Africa's access to financing is still a challenge. So we are an important source. And then the third layer is job creation. You know, this is a shared objective. Our financing supports jobs in the United States, but it also helps to create jobs in Africa. So when we finance, viable transactions through sustainable finance. You know, I believe that America-made products will drive economic growth and power the African econ ec economies to thrive and diversify. So we are proud to support exports and investments across its various economic sectors. In the end, we share similar goals of supporting jobs, improving people's lives, and that's why I'm proud to be signing today the MOU with Afri Bank. Okay. Let me start by expressing our deep appreciation to the people and government of the United States of America under the leadership of President Joe Biden for hosting the momentous U.S. Africa uh, Leaders Summit currently underway. Special thanks to Chair of U.S. Section, Rita Jo Lewis, as well as the Board of Directors and Management of U.S. Section for the strong partnership at our Flexing Bank and the Exim have quickly rebuilt and for agreeing to formalize the intentions to jointly deliver on our shared aspirations in a memorandum of understanding. By signature of the memorandum of understanding, we move from intentions to action and set the stage for our two institutions to serve as anchors for a renewed, vibrant, U.S.-Africa trade and investment relations. The new partnership we are forging will embolden businesses on both shores to step out, explore, and do deals for the benefit of Africans and American people. As we look around the world today, we see that most countries that have successfully made giant strides towards economic development and industrialization have the U.S. to thank for it in terms of capital and investment inflows, technology transfer or diffusion, skills and capacity development, and access to markets. In almost every case, U.S. Exim was pivotal to in de-risking those markets and facilitating capital and technology transfers. In turn, these foreign investments boosted productive activities in the U.S., all of which improved global welfare. Africa did not quite participate in that golden relationship that pulled billions out of poverty, especially in Asia. Perhaps because organized as 55 atomistic countries, dealing with each and every one of them was always seen to be a problem. But today, a lot has changed. The fragmented African markets are now integrated into the African continental free trade area under the AFCFT agreement. A Fresen Bank, the Continental Exim Bank, has gained significant capacity to confidently play its role as a trade finance bank for Africa, interfacing with and mitigating risks for partners and financial institutions interested in doing business in Africa. There can be no better time, 
no better opportunity for the U.S. to do for Africa what he did for Asia. There can be no better time for U.S. Exim and Afrizim Bank to forge a bond of partnership that can propel the new U.S.-Africa partnership beyond aid. So as the political actors from the U.S. and Africa gather here to, and renew their commitments to a stronger alliance in today's fractured world, our two institutions must convert political intentions into concrete business, trade, and economic gains for the expectant African and American people. The time to act is now. And by entering this MOU with U.S. Exim, a present bank is helping to open that window of opportunity. The Memorandum of Understanding enables us to solidify the partnership between our two institutions and open new vistas for deeper and broader collaborations in advancing trade and investment flows between the U.S. and Africa. Specifically, our partnership will foster the realization of the aspirations of the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit, which among others include forging new U.S.-Africa economic engagement, improving livelihoods through employment creation, strengthening health systems and infrastructure, as well as assuring food security, promoting climate adaptation, and deepening support for the private sector, including the African diaspora in the U.S. Through our renewed partnership, we will together support trade and economic integration in Africa by helping to revive and strengthen African airlines through refleeting and other technical support and facilitate strategic investments in healthcare, power and transportation, infrastructure, including rail and road projects, including investments also in renewable energy. We will also be supporting the creative industry as well as the projects that the diaspora in the U.S. will be doing all over Africa. I look forward to mutually rewarding partnership and thank you, Chairperson, and your board for this opportunity. I hope that with this, we open a new, a new door for bigger things to happen, not only for the U.S., but also for Africa. Thank you very much. So there you have it. The deal is signed. Always great to see collaboration between the U.S. and Africa. So as she mentioned, finance indeed is the lifeblood of economies, businesses, nations. So this deal should support initiatives to scale businesses and innovation across the continent. We're now going to have a conversation style presentation in the category of access to health care. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Sim Shabalala. He's the chief executive of Standard Bank Group. We also have Mr. Eyong Ibai, who is the executive director and general manager, GE Healthcare in Sub-Saharan Africa and the EMEA region. Please can we give them a round of applause? 
right, and we, oh yes, we have our moderator now. Welcome everybody. My name is Kate Johns and I have the distinguished honor of mo moderating today's conversation between Standard Bank and GE Healthcare. We'll be exploring a topic I know, that I know is critically important to all of us here at the US and Africa Summit, solving healthcare challenges in Africa through the power of accessibility. I'd like to introduce our distinguished African speakers today, Sim Shabalala, Chief Executive of the Standard Bank Group, and Iong Ibaya um, from GE Healthcare. Thank you, Sim. Thank you very, very much, Kate. Uh, and in particular, I'd love to give thanks to President Biden and uh, Vice President Harris for convening and hosting this very, very important summit. I'd also like to thank the US Chamber of Commerce and the Corporate Council uh, on Africa for convening the US Africa Business Forum. Uh, it seems to me quite a feat to pull together such a a complicated uh, arrangement with so many heads of state and so many business uh, men and women uh, in, Was in Washington. Uh, Standard Bank completely agrees with uh, President Biden uh, and his administration when they recognize that indeed this is the African century. And we agree completely with them as the Standard Bank group, as you know, Young, uh, our purpose is Africa is our home, we drive her growth. Uh, for those that are not familiar with the Standard Bank Group. It's been in existence since 15 October 1862. And I'm also proud to tell you that uh, GE formed its first subsidiary outside the United States in Johannesburg in uh, 1898. And on the 6th of May of that year, uh, you opened your first bank account at the Standard Bank Group. So this is a long-lived uh, relationship and we're very, very proud of it. Uh, we have got... Uh, a strategic partnership, um, uh, a collaboration with uh, GE Healthcare. Uh, we're very proud of it, uh, and it is going to make a pervasive, profound, and long-lasting impact on the African continent, and we'll be talking about it uh, during the course of, uh, of this morning. Eyang, over to you. Yeah, no, uh, thanks, Sim, and uh, thanks for uh, given the history lesson of our two sort of great organizations, you know, and, uh, you know, I think it's... Um, First, I'd like to extend the same gratitude that you, uh, uh, you put forward to uh, uh, the Biden administration for bringing such an important event back to the, the global agenda. Um, I, I think this summit really d demonstrates um, the US uh, commitment to Africa, and it's, and it's been an amazing experience to be able to work with so many and see so many friends and colleagues that are very much totally focused on the African continent. Um, I'll just say a little bit about G for uh, if anyone's been following the GE story, um, you'll, you'll, you'll be aware that uh, uh, next month we'll be spinning off into a standalone, dedicated, focused healthcare company. Um, and that gives us huge opportunities to really focus our entire um, uh, brain power and our, 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 our muscles to improve this really important sector. And, uh, and it's critical for the further growth of Africa to have a healthy African population. So, uh, so from a GE perspective, we're super optimistic, um, working with organizations like yourself as we continue to drive and grow um, and increase access to healthcare are truly fundamental and important for uh, the future of Africa. And I thank you for um, your organization's uh, um, openness and uh, our working relationship that's gonna deliver some amazing outcomes for clinicians that can therefore serve patients on the continent. Thank you both. Um, it's fairly unique to see a bank and healthcare operation, operation partner so closely. So I've, I've got a two-part question for you. How did the collaboration come about, and what outcomes will it produce? Um, thank you very much, Kate. Uh, from a standard bank perspective, uh, the purpose of the organization, as I've said, is Africa is our homeward driver growth. And one of the six strategic value drivers of our group is what we call social, economic, and environmental outcomes, which we consider to be as important as financial outcomes. That therefore commits us naturally to the SDGs, and in particular, uh, SDG number three in relation to, to health, uh, which commits us to ensuring healthy lives, uh, in essence. And for us, the relationship between GDP growth 
and uh, Human Development Index and the health of people are two sides of the same coin. Um, and it's important for us to give effect to, to both. Uh, we're also a founding signatory of the UN Environmental Program uh, Finance Initiative, uh, Principles for Responsible Banking, and the first principle there also commits us, we think, to uh, uh, decent health. Uh, all of this is not pie in the sky. Uh, we believe that uh, for nations to be productive, you need a strong, soft infrastructure, and an important element of that is the health of its, its people. And it's for these reasons that we uh, decided that uh, as an important element of executing our strategy, we'll build this strong relationship with GE Healthcare. Uh, we think that there is directly relevant evidence of the excellence of this relationship. Uh, since 2014, when we started this work with, uh, uh, with GE, we established a partnership uh, focused on improving access to affordable health care. Um, and we did that in several subsectors. Uh, one great example of that is the great work that was done by our subsidiaries, our respective subsidiaries in, um, in Kenya, uh, where we have installed and managed uh, diagnostic equipment uh, in Kenya's uh, public hospitals in partnership. We providing the finance, uh, GE um, Healthcare providing the, uh, the, the equipment. Uh, as a South African, I'm also proud to remind everybody that in 2017, uh, we agreed on effecting what we called a health accelerator, which effectively provided uh, skills, uh, infrastructure, and know-how to practitioners, black practitioners in particular in South Africa, uh, to great effect, and it's made a huge difference to, to, to our people. And so we envisage uh, the partnership we're talking about today to be a added vector of growth, uh, both in our relationship and in our impact on the African continent. Ian? Yes, look, just to, you know, just to add, and, and well said, Sima, I think one of the biggest barriers to accessibility of healthcare is, is, is cash, is money. Um, and that's at a single sonographer in a rural private healthcare clinic. And it's also the same at a, you know, multi-specialist uh, 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 teaching hospital. So f access to affordable finance on the continent is critical to be able to plug the healthcare infrastructure gap. And GE is looking for, and has been looking for partners to be able to achieve that. And that's why this relationship is such an important one that we're able to cross borders and have a real sub-Saharan Africa focus to enable the mum and pup shop sonographer to um, uh, uh, save lives essentially in rural clinics right the way through to working on complex multi-specialist hospitals or oncology, uh, or, or oncology centers um, across the continent. And I think you know, that combination of, um, uh, of a financial institution that has a focus on health and a organization that, like GE, that is US, but absolutely local um, and on the ground within, the, within the, the countries that we serve, gives a perfect combination to be able to extend access and be able to provide clinicians with the important tools that they need to be successful in treating patients across the continent. Thank you. In the interest of time, I'm just going to jump ahead to one of the questions that's important to explain to our audiences, the differences between our countries. Um, are there particular challenges or lessons learned from other organizations that you've had to overcome? That's for me, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so look, the Africa 54, right? Um, look, it's, it's an amazing continent that's such a rich or uh, um, hotbed of culture, uh, and, and diversity, be it language, be it um, uh, in, um, uh, be it from a language perspective, but also from a way of actually operating and structures. So, you know, I've worked in the UK before, I've done work in the US. It's a mo essentially there are mono economies. Africa is 54 different economies with different focus and different, uh, a different way of doing work. And so, being able to localize your solutions for the environments that we're operating in, I think are, are really important. And focusing on what's important for that country because there is no single approach. What we do in Angola, what we do in Kenya, what we do in Nigeria, what we do in South Africa 
is all driven by the actual local need because healthcare is local and that's really important for us. Sam, would you like to add anything? Yeah, for sure. Um, coming from South Africa, where you have two countries in one, uh, you have uh, wealth uh, and sumptuous uh, and beautiful buildings that would uh, compare with the best here in the United States on the one hand, and then on the other, you have got poverty that will make you weep, um, living cheek by jowl in one country. And so that is re represented also in the type of health care that people have got access to. And bridging that gap in South Africa and in other parts of our beloved continent is an important dimension to, 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 to growth. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to tell you that uh, in partnership with GE, we've spent uh, $36 million uh, in South Africa to provide uh, uh, our people with uh, the advanced technology that is necessary for decent health care, and we're very, very proud of that. Thank you, Sim, but let's get to the all-important question. How much is going to be invested in this new initiative? Um, we are delighted uh, to be able to announce today um, that uh, we are jointly committing to providing uh, these uh, product services and equipment, um, and we will be providing financing a standard bank to the extent of $80 million. <laughs> and where is that money going to be deployed? So as I alluded to, it's going to be across the entire healthcare um, uh, pyramid. So primary healthcare, you'll see um, uh, single clinicians and doctors and sonographers been able to access um, diagnostic equipment to work in the more, uh, you know, primary healthcare space. Um, it will be available for, you know, small and medium-sized owned hospitals to be able to upgrade um, their medical equipment to be able to diagnose in a more advanced and a more sophisticated way. And it will also be available for, you know, your multi-speciality hospitals where, you know, the likes or you know, the larger private care, care groups would be able to access some of this to actually also provide um, enhanced uh, medical technology and uh, digital solutions to, to, uh, to do the work. And perhaps just expand on which five countries it's going to be rolled out to? So let me get these right. Kenya, South Africa, Angola, Nigeria, Nigeria and Mozambique. Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you, gentlemen. What do you think would surprise our American hosts most about healthcare in Africa? I think they would be very surprised at the extent to which climate change uh, is accelerating uh, health care degradation on the African continent. For example, 30 million people in the Horn of Africa face um, drought and as a consequence starvation, um, a combination of food security, starvation and therefore um, uh, health issues. And it's therefore in that context that we would argue that addressing the most serious issue of our generation, which is uh, climate change, uh, is central also to addressing the health issues that we face on the continent. Thank you, Sim. And how can American partnerships help with access to healthcare across Africa? Yes, you're right. So um, we think that uh, as Africans, we would want to be grateful to the US government and uh, the American uh, people for the hundred billion dollars um, that has been dedicated to public health on the African continent. Uh, it's something that ought to be uh, noted and celebrated and that in addition to uh, CSI investments that have been made by Americans is staggering. So if you add the commercial aspects uh, to it that we are talking about today, um, you have to recognize that uh, this is something that uh, um, has to be celebrated. I have to just add, though, that it would be wonderful, though, if Africans themselves could say that we're providing our own resources to addressing uh, the health issues as well. Young, in closing, any other remarks? Yeah, look, I think from a, a GE healthcare perspective, um, like I say, we're a local African business, but a US uh, multinational, right? So. We, we, you know, we have staff in 
three major cities, um, uh, uh, Lagos, Nairobi, Johannesburg. We have three ma major offices across those three. 95% um, of the people we employ are from those markets or from those countries. Um, but we're able to utilize our global expertise and the expertise of our, of our, so our mothership in, in the US to be able to provide world-class technical and clinical support um, for, the, for the continent. So I think for us, that's really um, you know, one of the benefits of working for an American multinational is that you can actually deliver world-class um, systems technology to some of the most far-flung parts of uh, sub-Saharan Africa and be able to connect them and train them effectively to be able to utilize them for the patients. Thank you both. We're going to close, but it's just to say that this partnership is an example of the tremendous efforts in deepening the relationships between the United States and Africa. Thank you both for your time. Thank you, Kate. Great job. Thank you very much, Kate, for moderating that. Thank you to Mr. Shim Sh Sim Shabalala, Chief Executive of Standard Bank, and Mr. Ayong Ibai, Executive Director and General Manager, GE Healthcare, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the EMEA region. A concise but insightful conversation on how large US and African institutions are getting together to improve access to healthcare on the continent. Our next announcement this morning is in the mobilizing trade and investment category. It will be presented by John Nevergol. He's the CEO of the ABD Group. He comes back for that. And we also have Mr. Bill Killen. He's the CEO of Accra Bridge. But before they, as they come onto the stage, I'd like you to turn your attentions to the video screen as we play a short video. At Acro Bridge, our guiding philosophy is to use our bridging solutions to serve and connect people and communities around the world. Acro Bridge specializes in the design, manufacture, and supply of prefabricated modular steel bridges. We've been a world leader in the industry for over 60 years, delivering our bridging solutions across the globe. We have extensive experience on the African continent with project deliveries to more than 20 countries in the region. ACRO also arranges the financing for these important projects. In Tanzania, ACRO partnered with the National Roads Agency to provide three single lane bridges. A key feature of the project was the extensive training ACRO provided to the Tanzanian engineers, technicians, and contractors in the assembly, installation, and maintenance of the ACRO bridges. The training begins in the classroom, where trainees learn the basics on site preparation, assembly, launch methodologies, positioning techniques, driving surface installation, and final commissioning of the bridge. The training then moves to the construction site, where ACRO's technicians guide the trainees in the safe implementation of the methods covered in the classroom. Upon completion, the trainees earn certification in the assembly, installation, and maintenance of ACRO bridges. And the local National Roads Agency now has teams of technicians qualified to assist in the development of bridge projects across the region. ACRO's bridge project in Tanzania builds on a decades-long legacy of partnership with communities across the continent, helping connect people to schools, hospitals, and economic opportunity, and expand their personal prosperity, now and into the future. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, first of all, my name is Bill Colleen. I'm with the Acro Bridge Company. I'm the CEO of the company. Uh, 
if you're not familiar with us, uh, ACRO is a privately held company. Uh, it is uh, in the state of New Jersey, and what we do for a living is we manufacture modular steel prefabricated bridges. Uh, we manufacture them uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. We also manufacture them uh, over in the UK, uh, very near uh, Chepstow. Uh, what uh, we've been doing for really for a couple decades now is that uh, we've been supplying bridges to the African continent, and the, the needs are, are, are pretty great. It, when I say we've been supplying bridges, we've supplied about 1,500 bridges uh, since about the uh, year 2000. Uh, we still need to supply many more so that uh, the deficit can be uh, maybe reduced. I don't think it will be eliminated, but it will be reduced because I was just saying uh, in the other uh, meeting uh, a little while ago that uh, we see the need for bridges to be about 190,000 bridges on the continent in sub-Saharan Africa alone, not including North Africa. And that's a massive, uh, massive need. So we're not going to achieve improving these uh, roads and bridges uh, one at a time. We, we need to do it more like what we've uh, signed yesterday with the country of Angola, where we have an MOU with them for 186 bridges. Uh, and the project value is about 370 million uh, fully uh, delivered and constructed. So uh, I'm trying to think what else to tell you about ACRO uh, at this time. We, we, we also uh, pass on, I think this is an important aspect of it, we pass on the uh, training to the local people as uh, we are building the bridges. This way we're, we're basically uh, uh, educating the constructors of bridges for the future so that uh, if we're not there, uh, so be it. They'll be able to uh, build those bridges. But uh, a, a thing that ACRO has promoted for years is uh, uh, here in the United States, uh, the term is called accelerated bridge construction. And what that really means is, is that, uh, such as what we're doing in the country of Panama right now, uh, we're building 100 bridges and they're all going to be built within about one calendar year, which is quite a feat. And if uh, with accelerated bridge construction, which is, it's almost really what, uh, what we created back in the 60s and the 70s in this business. And now it's utilized uh, in many uh, areas of construction, even uh, for concrete bridges and others. But it, it will help to really uh, cut into the, the need uh, for bridges and uh, start improving uh, the roadways. Uh, I, I was saying before that the, uh, the restrictions on the roads uh, most impact that 60% of the population that live uh, in the rural areas of the continent. And we really need to reach out to those people and engage them and embrace them because they are going to be critical to the sustainable uh, growing economies of these nations. Uh, so that's really one of the reasons why when we have supplied our 1,500 plus bridges, we saw that need and we, we targeted the uh, rural road districts uh, so that we could hopefully, uh, the term I used before was build it and they will come. Uh, because I have actually witnessed myself where we've built the bridge and then all of a sudden uh, entrepreneurial skills uh, appear with uh, the locals and they uh, either do it with farming or they make products that they uh, can now get to a market that was uh, impossible to uh, get to in the past. So we have now done this, uh, this type of work. I would say it's in about 22 of the nations where we have uh, organized uh, development bridge projects. Uh, typically, the projects range anywhere from 40 to, uh, say, 180, like this one here, 180 bridges. And uh, this way, uh, uh, the... Uh, you know, the, as I said earlier, the, the number of uh, bridges that we uh, impact are more rapidly uh, developed, uh, which is a good thing so that we can get commerce flowing because a lot of times what people don't think about is the life cycle cost of a bridge. And when you put a bridge in, and it could be even here in the United States, 
uh, you put a bridge in and if you take it out of commission, it, it really costs the local community significantly to have that bridge out. And, and we've demonstrated that time and time again, even here in the United States, uh, where when a bridge was lost and we came in within days and replaced the bridge uh, so that the local uh, commerce and families, et cetera, health uh, institutions can um, uh, have the people flowing and uh, keep the commerce flowing. Uh, so I think with that, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, John. We both happen to be on the PAC DBIA, and uh, I give you the floor. All right. Thank you, Bill. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is John Nevergo. I'm CEO of ABD Group. I'll keep the introduction to ABD Group short because uh, some of you might have heard it earlier. But ABD Group's a leading project developer in Africa. Over the last 15 years, uh, we've developed critical infrastructure in 21 countries, resulting in a little over two and a half billion of investment, ranging across uh, healthcare, transport, industrial parks, and wastewater. Um, for us, it's just extremely exciting to be part of this project that's gonna be transformational for Angola, interconnecting communities, uh, and, and supporting just the growth of the people in Angola. At the same time, as Bill mentioned, it's supporting hundreds of manufacturing jobs back here in the U.S., uh, in Pennsylvania, where the ACRO facility is. Extremely exciting to me, being from Pennsylvania, and indirectly thousands across the, uh, the steel, galvanizing transport and logistics industry. So this is a perfect example of what this UF Africa, Africa Business Forum is all about, creating commercial ties that benefit the U.S. and our partner countries, in this case, Angola. Um, one thing that I want to sort of go over a little bit is a key element, as you saw in the presentation, which is the, the financing of the projects. Uh, this, again, it's a fantastic example of PGII at work, mobilizing resources to deliver critical infrastructure and increasing American competitiveness. As Bill mentioned, for this project, we're mobilizing 100% of the financing, Euro 370 million for this project. This could not have been done without, and which is key to any project you're working in, the strong support of the government of Angola, from the president to the minister of finance to the minister of public works. They prioritized it, and they made this a, a priority for the country. That's why the funding will be closed for the project. At the same time, the benefit they get from working with American companies is that we bring to the table projects and funding solutions that keep environmental, social impact at the forefront. It's a prerequisite for the funding. At the same time, funding is provided in a secure, a transparent manner, so it's clear and visible to all. This is why it's very exciting for us that XM is back in the game and crucial that they stay and become aggressive in Africa to support the growth of American companies. I just would close it in just saying that, you know, we can't thank the government of Angola uh, enough for its strong leadership, and most importantly also to the U.S. government back here at home and in Angola under the leadership of uh, Ambassador Mashingi, as well as the Commerce Department, this project could not have moved forward without their support, and we're honored to be part of it. Okay, one more photograph. Thank you, John. Thank you, Bill. So building the hard infrastructure needed for economic development in Africa. It's coming to Angola. It's coming to Africa. It's great to see this deal getting done. All right. So this next announcement, it's in the climate and energy category. It is the Mirova Gigaton Fund. Please welcome Scott Nathan, the CEO of DFD, and Ryan Livingston, the CEO of Mirova Sun Funder. A round of applause for them, please. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Wale, for the introduction. And thank you to all who have traveled uh, to Washington, D.C. for this summit. Welcome. Uh, I'm very grateful to President Biden for convening African leaders from across government and the private sector so that we can collaborate on ways to strengthen our economic ties and deepen our commitment to the continent. Thanks to uh, Prosper Africa for its partnership in putting together this deal room. And finally, thank you to Ryan Levinson, the CEO of Morova Sun Funder, for joining us today. More to come on our work with them uh, in a moment. 
So I'm the CEO of the Development Finance Corporation. Uh, the Development Finance Corporation was launched three years ago. It's the modernized development finance institution of the United States, and Congress gave us a dual mandate to make highly developmental investments around the world and advance the nation's strategic foreign policy priorities. We meet that mandate by investing with the private sector to tackle some of society's greatest challenges, from energy security and climate to food security, health care, large infrastructure, and small business support. DFC's work helps strengthen communities, making them more resilient, stable, and ultimately the goal is to make them more prosperous. That's why investing in Africa is a top priority for DFC and core to its mission. With one of the world's fastest growing populations, most diverse ecosystems, and significant growing youthful population, our work in Africa has an outsized developmental and strategic impact. Across the continent, DFC has more than $11 billion in active commitments, and under the Biden-Harris administration, our agency has committed more than $2.4 billion to support development projects in the private sector across Africa. And just today, we're announcing an additional $369 million in recent active commitments in Africa. Our investments have a far-reaching impact, whether through creating the opportunity for more transportation and employment, such as with uh, SA Taxi in South Africa, or the expansion of data centers to ensure digital connectivity, uh, including in South Africa and Kenya. We've invested with the uh, One Acre Fund, supporting smallholder farmers to move beyond subsistence farming. We've also made investments to expand the production and reach of vaccines. But we can do more. We must do more. And DFC wants to deepen our engagement with Africa. Currently, we have active commitments in more than 30 nations, 38 to be exact. And we want to do more transactions uh, in more markets. And since all of DFC's work includes private sector partners, we're especially happy to be here today in the deal room. We know private business and investors have the ingenuity, the energy, and the alignment of interests that is essential to solving Africa's biggest challenges. Partnership, working together, is essential to long-term success. Investments must be sustainable, and we have to measure the impact. I hope we'll come away from today with some potential new partners and new leads for possible future transactions to make even greater impact. But today, we're here to lift up our work with a current partner. I want to highlight one of our commitments today that fits with the theme of the forum, partnering for a prosperous and resilient future. Access to reliable and secure electricity is the key to unlock economic development. DFC's $100 million investment in the Morova Gigaton Fund will advance that work by financing distributed clean energy projects, including to communities not connected to the grid at all. Ryan, you and your team have been long-standing important partners for DFC and our primary predecessor agency, OPIC, in this effort to provide reliable access to sustainable power. From our first grant, as you were just getting started in 2013, to the latest $100 million in financing, DFC has supported you over the years as your organization has helped millions of people in Africa access reliable electricity for the first time. We're proud to be one of Morova Sun Funder's investors as you build on the company's successful track record. So I'm now very pleased to hand over the stage to Ryan who can share more about the company and its work. Thanks very much. Thank you, Scott. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ryan Levinson, the co-founder and CEO of Morova Sunfunder. We are now so pleased to announce uh, our new 500 million blended finance debt fund called the Morova Gigaton Fund with an initial $100 million commitment from DFC, which we will be signing here shortly. 
The fund will be focused on scaling up investments in distributed clean energy in Africa and other emerging markets. The fund will invest in off-grid solar home systems and mini-grids, commercial and industrial solar energy systems, the solarization of telecom towers, solar in the agriculture sector, electric mobility, and other clean energy technologies. As Scott mentioned, our partnership with DFC began almost a decade ago and has included anchor investments in both of our two previous funds, as well as early grant support, starting with as little as $150,000 when we were just starting out as early pioneers in this sector that's focused on clean energy access and climate solutions in emerging markets. 10 years ago, my business partner Audrey and I saw a big opportunity for solar and other clean energy to play a key role in mitigating climate change and helping to solve energy poverty in emerging markets. However, access to financing has been a huge challenge for clean energy companies and projects in these regions. So we started SunFunder with a mission to pioneer and scale financing for clean energy and emerging markets with a focus on Sub-Saharan Africa. We were a first mover in the sector, 100% dedicated to financing distributed clean energy. And thanks to the support from DFC, we were able to start building our local presence in East Africa. We believe that to do this right, it was important to build a team with deep market expertise and based in the markets where we work. So we're now a 40-person team from 17 countries, the majority based in East Africa and Nairobi. To date, we've closed over 200 million loans to 58 clean energy investees in 23 countries. And these loans have now helped over 10 million people gain access to sustainable clean energy and reduce over 1 million tons of CO2 emissions annually. We've done this by raising blended finance debt funds with support from DFC. Earlier this year, we were acquired by Morova and are now called Morova Sun Funder. Morova is an asset manager with about 25 billion euro of assets under management, and they are 100% focused to sustainable and impact investments. They're a subsidiary of Natixis, which is one of Europe's largest asset managers. They acquired us to lead their clean energy investment strategy in emerging markets. And I think it's a really great example of how support from DFC is helping to mobilize institutional capital to invest in these sectors. Emerging market economies will and are driving the rise of global energy demand around the world. And this is why you can't address climate change without focusing on clean energy in emerging markets. Um, that's why we're focused on doing what we do. None of this would have been possible without the support from DFC, who's been our largest and most consistent investor over the past eight years. Their support will not just help us mitigate climate change and reduce energy poverty, but in the Gigaton Fund, will help mobilize 250 million of institutional capital, which is key to scaling up the clean energy transition in emerging markets. DFC has been such a great partner for us over many years, and we're very grateful to have this opportunity to grow the relationship to the next level. Thank you. Thank you. So now we have the signing, Scott and Ryan. Right. Gentlemen, before you leave, I just wanted to ask a quick question. Um, as you know, we have an audience watching. If anyone out there feels they qualify to get some capital from this fund, what do they do? You want to say a few words about that? Sure. <laughs> I think we have like two minutes. Thank you. Great question, Wally. I appreciate it. Um, you know, the DFC is looking for projects uh, in all sectors, uh, energy, healthcare, closing the digital divide, 
small business, agriculture, large-scale infrastructure. We support private sector projects. So uh, if any of you out there have good project ideas for us, we're interested, we're really ambitious about increasing our uh, portfolio, taking more risk to, take, to make more impact uh, throughout Africa, throughout the world. So if you have uh, projects, go to our website. There's information there about how to apply, what our criteria are, what sectors and regions uh, we're currently looking to do more financing transactions. We'd be thrilled to be, um, uh, to be in receipt of your ideas. We want to partner with you. That's our goal, working together to make impact uh, to solve uh, the, really the biggest challenges uh, that we all face together. Thanks so much. Thank you. Another round of applause for Scott and Ryan. So the fund is live, if you like. He's shared how you can participate in that. So make the most of the opportunity. Thank you. No, right this way. Yes, thank you. So our next announcement this morning is in the category of digital transformation, and it will be presented by Al Kelly. He is the CEO of Visa. Please welcome him to the podium. But before Ke uh, Mr. Kelly comes, uh, we also have a short video presentation. So again, turn your attention to the screen. This innovation center is all about capitalizing on the technology that allows us to offer unique solutions to consumers, unique customer experiences to our customers here in Sub-Saharan Africa. Innovation must come with purpose. Without purpose, innovation does not bring real value. We have to continue innovating. And what stops us is not the resources. What stops us often is our courage. I now officially declare the Innovation Studio for Sub-Saharan Africa in Nairobi open. When we think about innovation and why it matters to us, I think for us, it being a purpose-driven company, which is really about uplifting everyone everywhere, the only way you can actually successfully do that is by being able to understand the needs of each of the markets that you're in and innovate around how you bring convenience, how you bring simplicity, how you bring security and resilience to that experience. Innovation is, is innate in us, uh, but it has to be purpose-led. It has to be driven by what the customers want. It must be secure and it must be scalable. Innovation must be uh, nurtured across the organization. There needs to be a reward for innovators. Because sometimes you find that people in an organization have ideas about how to improve and how to achieve the mission of every organization using technology in a new way, but then they're not rewarded for it. Well, good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to be with you today and to share more with you on Visa's continued commitment to one of the most dynamic and exciting regions in the world. I'd like to thank the U.S. Department of Commerce, the Prosper Africa Initiative, and the organizers of the U.S. Africa Business Forum for convening such an important meeting that will help to further strengthen the deep and lasting and important ties that exist between the United States and all the countries in Africa. This event underscores the importance of increased cooperation on shared global priorities. I'd also like to thank you for joining the session to learn more about Visa's commitment to Africa, including our pledge to invest $1 billion in Africa over the next five years. Africa is central to Visa's global growth ambitions. We've been present in Africa for more than five decades and opened our first office in Johannesburg in 1992. Since then, we have broadened and deepened our footprint, and today we enable digital payments in all of Africa's 54 countries, working with clients, partners, and governments to facilitate millions of transactions each and every day. Our local presence has given us firsthand knowledge of the tremendous pace of economic and societal progress across the past decade. 
Africa is in the midst of a massive digital transformation as more people connect to the internet and subscribe to mobile services for the first time. While these trends have been gaining momentum prior to 2020, the pandemic has served as a true catalyst for accelerated digital transformation across several dimensions. Contactless payments, often referred to as tap to pay, practically non-existent five years ago, now represent nearly half of all in-person transactions on the continent. E-commerce has grown rapidly with the number of e-commerce users set to surpass 500 million by 2025. And the number of smartphones is set to reach over 650 million by 2025, nearly doubling since 2020. Despite excellent progress, there is more work ahead of us. Among the most important challenges is digital access and equity. More than 500 million customers and more than 40 million merchants in Africa still lack access to financial services, losing out on the benefits that come with secure, convenient, reliable digital payments. The opportunity to provide increased access to digital payments is one of the main reasons I'm proud to announce Visa's pledge to invest a billion dollars in Africa over the next half decade. Visa has continuously been investing in Africa for several decades, and we remain as optimistic and confident in Africa's future today as when we, as when we first began operations on the continent. Our increased investment will help Visa accelerate prospect, progress in three key areas. First, scaling our operations. Second, deploying new innovations and in technology. And third, deepening collaboration with key partners. In terms of scaling operations, we will build on our strong momentum of the last few years. We have invested in top talent across Sub-Saharan Africa and have grown our number of full-time employees by 60% in the last two years. In August, I was honored to visit Kinshasa to open our 10th office on the continent, and next year we plan to open an office in Tanzania. By expanding our local presence and local teams, we are further advancing digital e-commerce and, and having a positive impact on the communities in the region. Our second focus area in our investment is deploying new and innovative solutions, representing an enormous opportunity to contribute to Africa's digital transformation. We are introducing and scaling existing solutions across Africa that improve the payment experience and lower costs. For example, tap to phone turns a simple mobile phone into a payment acceptance device, reducing the barriers to acceptance. And solutions like Visa Direct can lower the costs of remittances and peer-to-peer -peer money transfers. We're also partnering to create the next generation of solutions for Africa. In fact, earlier this year, Visa opened our first innovation studio on the continent in Nairobi. This incredible facility provides access to tools that helps Visa's African clients and fintech partners co-create locally relevant payment and commerce solutions. And as we look ahead, we will continue to bring new solutions to market that make it easier for businesses, regardless of size, to accept digital payments. We will also partner with relevant institutions to invest in infrastructure that will make 2G and 3G more accessible for businesses. Innovation in Africa is flourishing, and the continent is ripe for game-changing business models. At Visa, we are committed to partnering to drive innovation forward. Finally, this pledge will allow us to further deepen collaboration with our partners, including governments, banks, and fintechs. Governments play a key role in advancing digitization, and on my recent trip to Nigeria, I was honored to meet with the Vice President and the Minister of Communications and Digital Economy. We have worked closely with them on programs supporting youth internship programs among U.S. multinational companies. We're also building strong partnerships with Africa's great ecosystem of innovators and entrepreneurs. We've launched a dedicated country programs for our Visa Everywhere initiative, FinTech competition, in Ethiopia and in Egypt. And our global program attracts entrants from across Africa. Just last week, Eo Arikikar of Thrive Logic in Nigeria won first prize in the global finals of the startup competition. In the last year, we launched She's Next, 
are programs aimed at supporting women entrepreneurs with funding, networking, and capital in North Africa and across Sub-Saharan Africa. By deepening our collaboration with banks, fintechs, MNOs, uh, and our other partners, we aim to open access to the financial ecosystem for millions of underserved people and small businesses. In summary, expanding our investments in business in Africa also meaningfully contributes to economic growth, job creation, and importantly, inclusion. Growing U.S.-Africa trade and investment ties is a win-win for our countries, our people, and our economies. We will have more to share over the coming months and years, but our presence here and our investment in Africa reinforces our commitment to innovating together to unlock the massive potential on the continent. I am truly excited to be working with all of our clients, partners on this journey that lies ahead. And I thank you for your presence here today, and we look forward to working with you to build a prosperous future that helps uplift individuals, businesses, and economies throughout the continent of Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. And I don't think I need to say that Visa means business. A billion dollars committed to Africa. Please, can we give them another round of applause? All right, our next announcement will be presented by Leslie Marbury. She's the Chief Operating Officer at Prosper Africa and Inyolua Aboyeji, Founder and General Partner at Future Africa. Please welcome them to the stage. Come on, guys, it's their show, Prosper Africa. Work together to advance our shared vision of a better future. We must all work together to advance our shared vision of a better future. A future of growing trade and investment that advances prosperity for all our nations. A future that advances lives of peace and security for all our citizens. A future committed to investing in our democratic institutions and promoting the human rights of all people. I have tremendous amount of hope in the future of Africa and the U.S. Today. Uh, and that's because I believe that Africa needs America, and I believe, with no doubt, that America needs Africa. Africa is getting into the third revolution of what we call the ICT revolution. And uh, if the U.S. would like to be a real partner, then that opportunity presents a lot of, a lot of ways for the United States to increase the trade with Africa. I would love to see us at a point where relationships between Africa and the U.S. are mutually beneficial. And so we don't just think of investments in Africa as charity, but really we begin to understand all of the value that Africa and Ghana in particular can, can give the Western world. So over the next 10 years, I think the next 10 years are critical. Um, currently, Africa has over a billion very young population and some of the fastest growing economies. So it's very important. It's a very important relationship with the United States. And what I'd love to see is just really increased investment as well as trade and trade in both directions, because there's a lot of interest um, from African investors and companies into the U.S. Uh, as daunting as it may seem, but yeah, you could create an impact. And that impact, in fact, creates market differentiation. Uh, we're talking about fair trade, the empowerment of women, and the giving job to the youth. This reduces also the human trafficking and, and reduces the extremism. In some sense, what I'm trying to say, I can create peace. Hello, everybody. I'm Leslie Marbury, the Chief Operating Officer for Prosper Africa, and it is just an honor to host this deal room today and announce all these bold new commitments. Um, what a powerhouse we've had in this room today. City, 
Visa, M Pharma, and more, all coming together to advance deals and unlock future opportunities. For me, the common thread is this commitment to investing in a true two-way partnership. This partnership that creates jobs in the United States and in Africa, that creates shared prosperity, that takes the US technology and capital markets and combines them with the Africa's dynamism and digital revolution. And this is really what Prosper Africa is all about. Today, Prosper Africa plans to commit $170 million to up our game. <laughs> Through new catalytic partnerships, we plan to boost African exports to the U.S. by a billion dollars. <laughs> and to mobilize a billion dollars of U.S. investment into Africa. And we plan to do this in five very specific ways. First, we're investing in the infrastructure required for businesses to grow. Through a partnership with USAID and Trademark East Africa, the US government is investing $25 million and plans to leverage over 90 million from private and private investment. Second, we're unlocking financing and the power of US capital markets through partnerships with the Institutional Investor Network and MEDA Advisors. We'll bring in our US institutional investors and channel that patient capital into Africa's infrastructure and markets. Third, we're expanding supply chains. We're connecting thousands of African businesses with US companies. And we're launching a new AGOA support services to drive those connections and get businesses the information that they need. Four, we're accelerating digital trade and e-commerce through a new Prosper Africa Tech for Trade Alliance that will bring the best of US technology and African companies together. Five, we are working to advance AFCFTA by engaging the US private sector in its implementation through new partnerships with McKinsey, the Corporate Council of Africa, and more. And six, maybe my favorite, we are investing in Africa's innovation and entrepreneurs. Um, we are launching a new Prosper Africa catalytic capital facility. And today, we are announcing five partnerships under this facility. Um, and I'm very excited to have one of our partners on stage with me. Uh, but we, I should name the others. Okavango, um, Endeavor South Africa, Altree, um, and Future Africa. With these partnerships, we're investing in African asset managers. And with a little bit of US government funding, these funds will mobilize over $200 million in private capital. We are gonna to work together to create jobs, invest in Africa's future. So I'm really excited um, to introduce my friend um, and really one of the most dynamic and active and influential early stage investors in Africa. Uh, Mr. Aboyeji, uh, my friend E, what I call him. Um, and E, I mean, for me, I just, um, oh, not maybe a year ago, we met in Nigeria and Lagos, and uh, your vision was inspiring. I have changed the way I thought about Prosper Africa to try to channel your vision, and I'm just really excited to be with you on the stage Our today. Shared <laughs> Our shared vision. Thank you so much for the world welcome. My name is Iolua Aboyeji, and I am the founding partner of the Fund for Africa's Future, which is more popularly known as Future Africa. Future Africa is the continent's largest early stage investor. We've invested in over 100 companies on the continent that are turning Africa's biggest challenges into global business opportunities and demonstrating their impact by delivering outsized returns and impact. We're the only fund with two unicorns. And we have 
worked very closely with the ecosystem to help our companies and a broader ecosystem of companies, our companies collectively worth $6 billion to raise over a billion dollars of follow-on capital from US venture capital. And 40% of these companies have a woman on their founding team. And 90% of them are Africans living in Africa. And as Leslie mentioned, we're so excited today to announce our partnership with Prosper Africa to leverage the catalytic facility to be able to advance this incredible partnership and progress by building and funding companies that are advancing Africa's digital economy in very close partnership with Prosper Africa and the US government. What's really special about today is that it brings full circle a story of the last eight years. You know, in 2014, while Obama was still president, you know, we attended a program just like this one. And at that program, there was incredible commitments that were made, which many of us probably thought were just air. You know, more commitments, more promises from the US government. And I remember myself at the time, I was a tiny young upstart. I had just started a transformational company called Andela with three amazing Americans, um, Jeremy Johnson, Christina Sass, and Ian Cannavale. And what we wanted to do was to accelerate African talent by training them with digital skills and helping them to work on the internet. Eight years later, that business is a $1.5 billion company backed by SoftBank, <laughs> backed by backed by Spark Capital, backed by the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, and backed by Generation Investments, led by Al Gore, former Vice President of America. And so I have a lot to be thankful for with our partnership with the US government, because it has yielded such incredible results. But we didn't just stop at working with young people to take their incomes from $100 a month to $100,000 a year with Andela, and scaling that partnership to 800,000 young engineers on the African continent that are earning middle class wages working on the internet. We started to build companies led by myself. I took the first step and went and built another company called Flutterwave, um, which is the most valuable startup on the continent, a $3.5 billion company that is payment infrastructure for Africa and interestingly enough backed by Visa, which just left the stage before us. Since that time, it's not just been us, it's been hundreds of companies that have rallied an amazing wave of investments from the US into Africa. Over $5 billion in investments last year from US venture capital into Africa. This is the biggest story in the world that nobody is talking about. And so here we are again today to make another commitment to building Africa's future. And this time, the commitment is to build the foundations of Africa's digital economy, together again with the US government. And I dare say we've done a lot of um, under-promising, and we're looking forward to the over-delivery in this session, because the journey we've begun on today is really about building together with Africa a partnership that enables Africa become a giant of the digital, $11.5 trillion digital economy. We want to build new pipelines for talent that will work on the internet from Africa into the rest of the world. We want to build infrastructure to support those young people who work on the internet and create jobs from these services built on these infrastructure. We want to build new markets that go beyond just serving the poor to serving those who are underserved in many, many different areas of life, particularly those working in Africa's digital economy. And most importantly, we want to push the frontiers of the green economy to ensure that Africa is leading the charge with growing green while the rest of the world tries to figure out going green. And I'm excited that at the end of our partnership, we'll be able to come back here again, perhaps in another 10 years, because in Africa, because we're so young, we have the luxury of thinking in decades, to come and announce again that we've done the work to create a trillion dollars in follow-on investments 
and we're looking forward to doing even more. Thank you, and God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria and the United States of America. I think that deserved another round of applause. I mean, if, if that didn't inspire you, I don't know. I mean, we're going to have to do something, something special, really special. But that was, that was great. And that is what the Deer Room is all about. And as he mentioned, we look forward to coming back here in a couple of years and seeing the impact of these collaborations and conversations that we're having at the summit. All right, I think on that note, it's time for lunch. So I would just note a couple of things as we break for lunch. So first, we're not done yet. So we're going to still come back after lunch to deliver a few more announcements. But ne the networking lunch is from now till about 1.30. And the doors of deal room should reopen at about 2 o'clock. Now, between 1.30 and 2, President Biden is expected to deliver his keynote address. So right after that, we hope to just come here to conclude on the announcements. So this concludes the morning portion of our day-long program at the U.S. Africa Business Forum deal room. Our partners, the Chamber of Commerce and Corporate Council on Africa, have generously offered meal cards for journalists to purchase food. So if you received a dot sticker this morning, our staff will provide a meal card right at the back. So please connect with one of us here. All right, so on that note, we'll see you after lunch. Thank you. <laughs>